Welcome to The Cynical Developer, the podcast that helps you to improve your development knowledge and career through explaining the latest and greatest in development technology and providing you with what you need to succeed as a developer. We've recently launched our Patreon page, which can be found at cynicaldeveloper.com forward slash Patreon. If you aren't familiar with Patreon, it's an easy way for those who are interested in this show to help out by simply pledging a small amount each month in sponsorship. Now that could be as little as $5 a month, which is about £3.80, or as much as you like. You will enable us to dedicate more time creating more content to help you, including videos, more blog posts, and even more shows. So if you can, head over to cynicaldeveloper.com forward slash Patreon and get involved. In this episode, we talked to Zach Burt about a concept called SASAS, or Software as a Service as a Service. Zach began programming with QBasic at the age of nine and immediately found a passion. Since 2003, he's been working in Silicon Valley and New York City in individual contributor and leadership roles. In 2007, he launched his software consultancy business after his PHP application, Lame Factor, was acquired by WikiU Incorporated. He's passionate about open source, both in submitting pull requests and launching projects. He currently lives in Manhattan, where he enjoys playing basketball, meeting new and diverse people. He also actively encourages you to get in touch with him if you'd like to meet. Zach has been on the show before. Um, He was in episode 14 and he was on to talk about a book that he's authored called uh, Code for Cash. Um, It centers around the best practices for freelance software programming and consultancy. So once you finish listening to this episode, make sure you go and check out episode 14 if you haven't already. And uh, back to our guest. Welcome back to the Cynical Developer, Zach. Thank you, sir. James, it's a pleasure to be back on the show. Uh, I'm excited to be here. A lot has changed uh, since uh, our conversation on episode 14. We we renamed the book from Code for Cash to The Software Engineer's Guide to Freelance Consulting. Oh, kind of nice, nice and short. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and uh, right now I have this sort of a one-man campaign going against my co-author to rename the book again to The Programmer's Guide to Freelance Consulting because I feel like we may be artificially limiting our audience to people who, you know, feel they're worthy of the title Software Engineer. But that's a whole separate conversation. Sure, sure. Uh, sounds like, uh, sounds like a, a, a box of worms that to, uh, to get involved with. Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. Um, and plus we've already done one renaming. So I, you know, I think it would just be disastrous for a brand to do another one yet. You know, uh, I'm so tempted, but you know, what can you do? Yeah. Yeah. You just have to come up with, uh, another book and, uh, and call it that and have it, uh, on a similar topic. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Um, I, uh, so we have a companion book called 30 Days to Your First Freelance Programming Client. And it's basically just a, each day has like a different task you can do to boost your freelance profile. For example, starting a blog, uh, post writing an article and posting it to a relevant subreddit, updating your LinkedIn profile, going to Craigslist, looking for meetup groups and submitting a, uh, an inquiry to the hosts to host a lightning talk on a topic that you're proficient about, uh, stuff like that. And the, the software engineers guide to freelance consulting actually contains the 30 days book as an appendix, but we also market the 30 days book separately. Um, even for the same price, even though it's a subset of the other book. Yep. So, um, there's, yeah, I mean, it, it's a whole can of worms. Uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot about marketing now. Um, uh, one thing that I'm doing uh, in one of my projects is uh, doing a competitive landscape analysis of the freelance programming market and the various platforms uh, for that, such as Odesk, uh, now known as Upwork, uh, Craigslist, uh various code for cash, which is, uh, our entry into the market and, uh, you know, various other websites. So I will, uh, share my findings with you. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. That'd be interesting. So that's the, uh, the website's a bit like freelancer and things like that where, where you go on and, and, and you bid for work. Is that, is that right? Right. Um, and, 
uh, you know, there's there's a few different angles. Like, for example, there's a company like called Gigster and one called Gun.io, and they're yep. basically platforms for freelance developers, but they're really operating in an agency model where they they charge basically like two x your hourly rate to the client and then pay you one x, and then sure. you know they have overhead for you know various administrative stuff. Um, and then there are also platforms where you can bid out work um, on a fixed spec or uh, submit to for work as you know it, with your hourly rate. Um, but uh, I saw a tweet uh, yesterday uh, by Jason Lemkin, and Jason Lemkin is a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. He started a company called EchoSign. And Adobe bought it, and yep. it's for electronic signature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's a he's a VC now with his company Saster, S A A S T R, and he he basically it's like a VC fund that invests in software as a service and uh, like a co working space that specializes in uh, helping sales teams that sell software as a service. So he's like he's branded himself as a software as a service expert. Anyway, and one of his tweets last night said, the best startups um, have the uh, crispiest competition slides in their pitch deck. In other words, they know their market cold, they know all the different angles, they know how their market is segmented and how they're uniquely differentiated among the competition. And I saw that and I realized my knowledge in the area is you know, honestly lacking. I don't have the crispiest, freshest knowledge of the market. So uh, one of my tasks for uh, today and immediate priority is uh, getting a thorough uh, competitive market analysis going for yeah, the sure. freelance development market. Um, it's like, it's like something that yeah, like any sort of like a uh, business student would be like, Oh yeah, obviously, <laughs> obviously you need to have that. But in terms of uh, like a developer entrepreneur, it might not be the most obvious thing. No, so. no, def definitely not. It's, uh, yeah. It'd be interesting to see uh, one of these platforms work for uh, probably the, without trying to sound too big headed about it, the uh, the higher end developers. Because okay. uh, I've, I've tried a few of these services like, like that. Um, and always my bids are, are either just straight declined laughed at or you don't get <laughs> uh, a sniff in because you get um, people on there that are really work they're willing to work for next to nothing and um, I've just struggled to get anything out of them in the in the past when uh, when I've tried so if, if there's a model out there that uh, that works that'd be uh, that'd be fantastic yeah absolutely so I can tell I mean I don't have zero knowledge of the space I can tell you a few things so for example uh, there's this company called TopTal, TopTal.com, and they claim to cater to the top 3% of the market in yep. terms. And the rates that you pay for a TopTal developer uh, do reflect that. Um, but I can tell you that the interview process for getting hired at TopTal is competitive, and they are going to quiz you on algorithms and data structures, and they're going to give you like a text a uh, problem to solve, like a text uh, parsing problem yep. that looks like a simple, like, split the string, but you actually have to use, like, a binary tree. Um, sure. uh, just a hint. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, th there are definitely approaches. Then there's this Y Combinator-backed company called Gigster that um, is, uh, is trying to do this, but they're catering to enterprise software development. Um, and anyway, when I have the, the thorough analysis, I will definitely let you know, because, you know, I, uh, myself have experienced the issue of, you know, pe people don't really understand that when they pay twice the rate, they're often getting more than twice the value. Yeah. So yeah. if you're paying, you know, someone a hundred dollars an hour, for example, 50 pounds an hour, they might deliver you a solution that. Um, someone at five dollars or five pounds an hour would never even think of. Yeah, um, and you know that there's that is certainly an issue. And also, the people at the low end of the market tend to not be able to deliver quality solutions 
unless it's against a fixed specification. And I mean, even then, when you look at the code, it's like, are you are you kidding me? Like he, the, the way that they solve certain problems, like, um, right. So, um, in anyway, so in my uh, journey to skin this cat, so to speak, I'm I'm reading a lot of software engineering books um, uh, about like software project management. I uh, recently read one called Waltzing with Bears. That's by uh, Tim, uh, Tim, uh, Timothy Lister, I think it is. Okay. He, he wrote uh, Peopleware, which is one of the uh, classics in software engineering that basically yep. says, give all your developers a private office, um, <laughs> which I'm nice. laughing at because how rare is that? It, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> I mean, I can only think of one company that does that, Microsoft. Um other, other than Microsoft, I can't think of a single company that actually abides by these, you know, so-called best practices, um, which is really um, a shame. Um, but anyway, so in Waltzing with Bears, he talks about uh, risk management is essential to software development. And he says the same five risks uh, kill uh, all software projects, uh, you know, are, rise again and again. And only one of those risks is uh, poor developer productivity. Right. So like so there's so much uh, emphasis in the, in the field about, you know, screening developers and putting them through the, you know, the obstacle course of the whiteboard interview and whatnot. Um, yet it turned, you know, it's only 20% of issues on projects come from poor developer productivity. And, um, in my experience, uh, that can be managed against. Um, so, so we have like a, a kind of dysfunctional industry that we're working in, um, on many levels is I guess the general point that I'm making, yeah. but, um, I guess it's our responsibility to fix it. Yeah. Cause no one else will. Yeah, so uh, so we're here today to talk about um, this acronym of SASAS, or Software as a Service as a Service. Now, we'll rewind that a little bit. Uh, there'll be a, an acronym that most people, or most of our listeners, I would imagine, are familiar with, which is SAS, Software as a Service. But for those that aren't familiar with that, could you give us a bit of an overview of what uh, Software as a Service is? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a little bit of a history lesson. Um, about 20 years ago, when you wanted to buy software, you would have to go to a store and you'd buy it on a CD-ROM and then you'd install it. And it would be a, a fixed version of the software. And if you wanted to upgrade the software, you could either um, go to the store next year and buy it, or maybe you dealt with a distributor who would sell you software over the phone and order the upgrade. Um, but um, uh, we have shifted in terms of how we deliver software and how we build software to a model of continuous integration and continuous delivery. So uh, as soon as there's a new change that's released to master in production, becomes available, uh, the people who use software can get it right away. And this is because uh, instead of paying uh, a, a flat fee for license, they pay uh, a subscription fee to use the software. For example, I use Dropbox, which is software as a service, and I pay them $10 a month. And in exchange, during that month, I get access to the Dropbox software to store and back up my files. Yep. Um, you know, many different programs uh, that we I use for my accounting software is software as a service, uh, zero.com. I'm happy with it. My subscription management software for subscriptions to my software as a service business is a software as a service and it's recurly. So basically, any software with monthly billing or annual billing is software as a service. Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, we, uh, we love a good acronym um, as developers, um, but SASAS is uh, a bit of a mouthful. What is software as a service as a service? 
Okay, so I have to, you know, be full humility here. I, I don't know if I anyone else is using this acronym. I uh, have coined it. It's not exactly an industry term yet, and I'm not sure that it's the best way to refer to what we're doing, but SaaS is software as a service as a service. So uh, generally, uh, when building software as a service, you have a market and you build a specific product for them and you deliver it in exchange for monthly or annual subscription fees to a specific market. Um, and, and you basically have a SaaS software as a service that you're delivering to them. Now, I have this idea called software as a service as a service or SaaS that uh, implies that you build uh, one-off software solutions for people, but instead of building it for a fixed cost or a flat rate, you build it in exchange for a subscription fee. So we've been earlier in the podcast, we were talking about hourly rate for developers and how you know, you're competing against people in, say, uh, Bangladesh who are charging, you know, less than $5 an hour yep. or, you know, in, or who, you know, offer to clone Facebook in exchange for $600 or, you know, things like that. Um, I'm suggesting there's a possibility for an entirely new model of software development that instead of a flat rate or an hourly rate is a monthly rate or metered billing. So basically software is developed and then you pay for it as long as you're using it and you pay for it according to how much you use it. So rather than necessarily, you know, charging a flat rate for development or an hourly rate, it's all metered billing and people start paying for how much value they're getting from the service rather than you know, just necessarily exploiting labor or trading um, a fixed amount of labor or just for a fixed wage. And then all the profit goes to, you know, the uh, corporation. Sure. Uh, so I'm exploring this new model of software development. So it's a um, little bit like um, the way that um, the likes of the cloud charge, like Azure, where you have your Azure account and you can have your instances, but if you aren't using it, it doesn't cost you anything. But as soon as you're using it, you have to pay for that privilege of using it. Exactly. And it's it's exactly Azure and Amazon Lambda. So Azure has Azure functions yep. where it takes that even a step further. And rather than you know paying for the server while you're using it, you only pay for the server resources that you're using. So you only pay for the the amount of memory, and uh, CPU, CPU cycles, cycles that you yep. exactly. And this inspired, you know, a, a, an idea for a way to build software development based on how often the function is invoked. So uh, getting uh, a, a better approximation to the actual value that is being delivered. So I'll give you an example. Um, we have a client called WorkReduce, and they're an advertising technology company. And what they do is uh, they're an outsourcing firm that handles uh, human labor tasks for ad tech companies. For example, one of the things uh, that's done, that they do is that w when a new ad comes out, they will um, load the creative in a, in a preview site take a screenshot of the cre the ad creative or the ad image. Uh, creative is just an industry term for an ad image. So they'll take a screenshot of the creative and then they will send it to the client so the client can uh, confirm that the ad is rendering properly. Yep. Um, now, uh, so what we did is we built a software solution for them to uh, take a like headless Chrome and load the page and then take a screenshot of the page and then divide all the images based on white space using image magic and load them into separate files and then uh, dynamically just upload them to uh, their salesforce.com uh, database to where each uh, each order would be tracked so we we did all of that automatically for them and in order to reduce the cost of software development for them, 
um, instead of charging a huge markup, uh, we charge them a, a small flat rate for installation and, and wiring everything together, but then we bill them 25 cents per order every time the function is the serverless function is invoked and returned successfully. Yep. Okay. So if you, you've built the system for this one company and if they stop using that software before you get to the end of your um, your target um, value for, for your software before you... Because uh, you will have incurred a, a, um, a charge from developers and things like that to actually build this. What happens then? Do you not make a, a loss on that? Well, okay, so, so in this particular instance, what I did is I charged the company the exact amount that I paid the developer to write the code. Yep. Now, I didn't bill for my time, you know, managing the project at all, and I didn't make a profit margin. Uh, well, I, I, th I think I actually ended up with like a 5% profit margin on it, but, you know, I also have credit card fees and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, so I didn't really have a profit margin on this, but... You know, so all of the revenue comes from the metered billing. So the more valuable that the software is, the more often they use it, uh, the more they pay over time. And, you know, this is, I have to tell you that this is, this is not exactly a one-off uh, instance because I, I found uh, another, I'll tell you about another case study uh, where we're trying this model. But um, you're right, there's a, lo a lot more risk involved. Sure. Um, but then again, with, without the risk, then there's no possibility of capturing the upside. So we, we both know that a large percent of software projects get canceled. Um, and if you've worked in the industry for any amount of time, you'll have worked on projects that have been canned. Yeah. And through no fault of the developers, just, you know, it could be high quality code, it could be performant, you know, it could be clean, you know, like commented, et cetera. But uh, just for various reasons that are incidental to the software development process, like the marketing process, et cetera, changes in the industry, um, you know, the software projects get canceled. Um, so m one of my big picture goals is to better understand the forces of nature that lead to projects getting canceled and projects succeeding and uh, build those directly into the development process. Right. Uh, so uh, hence my mentioning uh, this, this book, uh, Waltzing with Bears, about software risk, uh, risk management and software projects. Um, so I, I'd love to share another um, example of, of how we're doing SASS. Um, in action. So I have this uh, software as a service company called Code for Cash. And essentially, we connect uh, freelance developers with freelance programming jobs. So we wrote, I started off by writing, I wrote like 30 uh, scrapers that connect to various RSS feeds around the internet. And um, uh, parse these RSS feeds for programming jobs, and then I send them to a human review team. And there's there's a lot of sorting that can't just that we can't do with uh, machine learning yet. Because yeah. machine learning is a lot of hype. You know, everyone's very excited about deep learning. There's been, you know, Watson has been advertising like crazy in the US. I don't know if they've been uh, advertising in the UK, but I can tell you that uh, word on the street is that it's all all sizzle and no steak. In other words, um, it's being marketed as you know AI is here, and we are we are the robots going to kill us soon? Are they going to, you know Skynet going to rise up? <laughs> the truth is, you know a AI isn't actually very good yet. Yeah, and even yeah. for things like basic text processing and sorting and discerning whether a job is on site or remote, it's just like it's not exactly a solved problem. No, no definitely not at all. Yeah. So we actually have, we have a human workforce who goes through and tediously labels each job through like you know they 
they read it and they, they, they think for a moment and then they, you know, use a select and that helps us tag and match jobs to developers more efficiently. Right. Yeah. But, you know, we haven't really pioneered anything in terms of the business model yet. Right now, we're just essentially a smart aggregator or search for developer jobs, for freelance jobs. So there hasn't really been much innovation yet. But one thing that we have done is in we we know that the value of our platform increases with the more sources of gigs that we have. So we have we have uh, eaten our own dog food, so to speak, with this SaaS ass idea by paying developers in our community to write scrapers to find freelance gigs that we haven't picked up, and then we pay them ten cents per gig right. uh, that okay. that goes into our feed. Yep. So uh, essentially, it's we're we found that this model works very well for a business because um, you know it allows us to pay f out the value that we're receiving directly um, without incurring uh, upfront costs. So you know, al although. We might be, you know, circumventing our own ability to make money using fancy financing schemes like raise capital at, you know, 20 percent interest per year, pay the developer up front, get an ROI after, you know, 12 months, et cetera. You know, and that's where the money comes in. It's all that is seems very complicated to me. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I'm. Uh, you know, uh, dissing it, so to speak, because I don't quite understand it to me. But it also, to me, it, se it seems like a bit of a, a bizarre pyramid scheme where, um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's all built on, you know, something that's propped up by these banks. And it, it's, it's so complex that no one really understands how it works. Um, and there's a lot of hand waving to it. So for me, it seems a little bit more intuitive to just pay out the value that you're receiving directly and um, and on an ongoing basis. To me, it seems a bit more aligned um, to, to structure development this way. And for, uh, for me, uh, I always wanted to be able to ca uh, capture more of the value that I produced as a developer because, uh, you know, I, I'd go to these companies, I'd work hard, you know, and, and really your ability to extract more value from the company is a testament, you know, to your ability to play politics uh, and do office politics correctly. And, you know, I'll, I, I accept that for what it is. Um, and, you know, OK, but I think that there's a better way of doing things. Yeah. So with SASAS, I am sort of trying to orient ourselves to a more win-win aligned developer friendly intelligent way of financing software development yeah and i think from from a developer's point of view i think uh, when somebody comes to you and says oh, i want you to build a system that does x y and z for me um and the majority of us would take that problem work out how many hours it would take us to build the solution and currently build the system and then bill it at that price that maybe it's only going to take me 30 hours to build this. So I build this application in 30 hours, charge you 30 hours worth of work, and then you go off and you make hundreds of millions of pounds or dollars with it. And it seems a little bit unfair, and I think what a lot of uh, people have been advising now is for developers to look at what the budget is of the the company that wants the software, what they're hoping to get from this software, how much they're going to or they're planning to make from it, and basing their and then base your fee for building it on those numbers. But this, I think, adds another dimension to it, doesn't it? Because you could say, right, it's going to take me thirty hours to build it. If I say, well you pay me 20% or 50% of, 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 that, of that 30 hours. And then after that initial outlay, it's going to be X um, dollars or pence or cents or whatever per successful request to use the, um, 
the, the example that, that you were using, that you, you pay me that per, per request through it later on, that you get a bit of a, a passive income continually as, as they're using your, uh, your bit of software. Right, right. And, and there's also ideas like, you know, software maintenance. And do you want to build something that's easy to maintain? And who is responsible for maintaining the software? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it, if you are, if you have to maintain the software in order to generate ongoing revenue for it, then um, you're going to be incentivized to write uh, cleaner code or, you know, in, add tests from day one and make it easier to refactor. Um, because it, it, it basically ch ch changes the alignment of incentives. Um, also, um, this, there's this big idea from that book, Waltzing with Bears, that I'm, I'm bringing up again, that uh, you know, companies expect costs uh, for software to be mapped out very precisely. Like it's going to cost this much and you're going to get this functionality but one way that companies fail is that they they do a lot of hand waving in terms of the software's benefits, um, and beca because they can't speak precisely about benefits, people end up building a lot of software that um, ultimately you know isn't actually needed by the market. Um, and I'm not talking about like events where it's no longer needed because there's a disruptive technology that came out and the dynamics of the market have changed completely. It's because you know. The, the decision of what to build has been based on things like um, politics and, you know, people having pet features that they want and, you know, various, various reasons, you know, people will want to kill the project so they overload it with unnecessary features. But by forcing yourself to quantify the benefit of any functionality that gets built, um, you're going to ensure that you're building something that has real value. And once you all know exactly how much it's going to benefit you um, quantitatively, uh, you can understand what a fair price for it is. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think because you, you are put under that pressure to just get it over, get it done and, and get on to the next, uh, next job once you've, uh, once you've quoted it and, and been accepted. But, but with this, because it's that, that, um, continued income on it um, and the possibility that you might need to actually work with it again it it does uh, force your hand a little bit to to take that little bit more time to make sure that it's right and uh, and easy to work with as well right right so this is this is base it's basically a new uh it's like an incremental uh iteration of agile essentially, because Agile was supposed to do this, right? It was yeah. supposed to say that, okay, we're, we're, we're instead of doing waterfall, we're, you know, we're, where we define all the features for the whole product and then we embark on this 18-month you know, development process to get it done, we will, we will change how we do development and we will develop in four-week cycles or two-week cycles and, you know, we're going to meet regularly with a customer and update their requirements and update our development process to this. But, you know, in, in, in the real world, um, mo most of the companies, you know, who claim that they're agile are just, you know, aren't really doing agile development. You know, maybe they're using a high level programming language like Ruby or Python, and therefore they think that they're being agile. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe they, they have continuous integration with uh, Jenkins or... Uh, you know, one of the various uh, CI circle or uh, services like that. And, and, but it, it, the, I think that by f forcing you to understand exactly what the benefits uh, quantitatively, what the quantitative benefits of the software are, you prioritize building high value things and you prioritize building code that delivers results. And uh, I think this framework provides a little bit more method to the madness, um, as well as uh, give, giving developers more power in negotiations 
because you know they're they're building something that will definitely deliver value and they can capture an appropriate percentage of the value um it, you know uh, th that that makes sense we're, we're so um a little tired. I'm, I'm a little uh, stumbling and muttering, but I, I hope this is uh, an idea that resonates with some of you. Yeah, I think uh, when we when we talked about it initially, um, I found it very confusing as to <laughs> what it was and and, uh, and and what you were trying to get at with it. But I think you you have cleared that that up um, f at least at least for me and hopefully for the uh, for the listeners out there as well. Um, but if they wanted to, uh, if the listeners wanted to come and find out more about it, um, do you have any online resources about this, or should they come and speak to you directly? Uh, they should definitely come and speak to me directly. Just send me an email, uh, Zach at code Um I'll I'll send that to you, and you can yep. put that on the website. Um, we have this. Um, we've been prototyping this serverless marketplace. Um, I, also, I just sent you the link via Slack um, where you can build functions and then, uh, you know, sell them on a metered usage, um, but it's not public facing at all. Right. Okay. So, um, and, and then, you, can, you know, you can fork a function and then, you know, you, you pay the owner on a, on a metered uh, billing basis. But like I said, we, we, it's not, uh, our approach to this is not public facing at all yet. So we, we don't have everything that we're doing is sort of behind the scenes until we um, figure out a, a, a scalable uh, blueprint for doing this. So if this is something that intrigues you and you want to talk about it, I encourage you just definitely to get in touch and we'll have a chat about it. Sure. Well, we'll uh, include all the, uh, the links to, uh, to the books uh, and the websites and, uh, and and contact details for Zach in the show notes. So uh, if anybody out there wants to to get in touch with Zach to, to talk about any of his books or to talk about uh, software as a service as a service, then uh, then they can do. I think uh, it's quite interesting and hopefully, you know, we can see you spearheading this and uh, may, maybe it become more commonplace in the uh, in the coming years and for the uh, industry. You know, yeah, and. Like I said, um, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. Uh, this is basically just an incremental improvement to Agile. And the reason that it's become feasible and obvious to do is because of the introduction of Azure and Azure Functions and AWS and AWS Lambda, where we have this ability to have metered billing for this, you know, the services that are used and you're only paying for the value that you're getting, you know, why shouldn't the actual software um, intellectual property uh, be metered the same way? Yeah. And, it, and it turns out that there's a lot of logic to it. But we'll, we'll see whether this method uh, catches on. You know, hopefully the idea is good enough to stand on its own. And hopefully I'll come up with a better way to explain it than... Sass ass, which sounds very confusing <laughs> and, you know, um, you know, also is, you know, perhaps like pejoratives. <laughs> You're such a sass ass, you know, so, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, there's a lot of work to be done, but I'd love to chat with anyone who's interested. Yeah, definitely. So uh, to anyone that is interested, get open into the show notes. Uh, get in contact with Zach, jump into his uh, Slack channel and uh, and have a chat on there. Drop any questions onto the um, onto the comments on the on the show notes page, and uh, I'll get back to you or uh, I'll point Zach at the uh, the right place to come and talk to you. And um, watch this space. This could be uh, the start of something very interesting for uh, for the software development uh, community. So uh, thank you for listening to Cynical Developer. I'm James Studart, and you've been listening to Zach Burt talking about software as a service, as a service. If you have any questions about this or any other episode, then drop us an email, a tweet, or leave a comment on the website where you can find all the resource links, show notes for each episode. And if you enjoy this episode, please leave a review on your favourite podcast platform, iTunes, Stitch, whatever it is, 
and help the cynical developer to reach more developers around the globe.